Okay, guys, so we're nearly there. Hopefully, we're on course to finish by about 7, uh, 8.15 or 20 past 8. Um, we will be st sticking around after that to answer uh, any questions that you guys may have. Um, but the last section is actually really, really important um, because this is one of these productivity things. These, This is one of the sort of main things that you're going to be doing. You know, you're going to be leading the ward round off, often, you know, in terms of guiding the consultant around to the right patients. You're going to be actually writing in the notes while the consultant or whoever's doing the ward round actually sees the patient. So you need to have systems and frameworks for writing in the notes concisely and efficiently. You're also going to be doing some clerking, particularly if you're doing sort of a medical medical job. You might be on call once a week during the day, part of a medical assessment team, clerking patients. So you need to know how to do a really good doctor clerking. So I'm going to explain how that's very different to what a medical student clerking is that you've probably been taught at medical school or hopefully been taught at medical school. And then finally, I'm going to talk about TTOs, um, you know, discharge summaries, the you know, the bane of the time sucker of most F1's existences. And I'm going to try and give you some tips upon how you can make those better and how you can not spend your entire time writing TTOs. OK, so first of all, let's get the common abbreviations out of the way. OK, so contrary to what you may have been told at medical school, you don't have to write everything longhand. And in fact, you shouldn't write everything longhand. There are commonly are used, commonly accepted abbreviations that are used all the time in hospitals that doctors, nurses, all of the members of the multidisciplinary team are going to understand. OK, they're there to make your life easier. Learn to use them. So what you're aiming for in all of this stuff, whether it's writing in the notes, whether it's clerking patients, whether it's writing a TTO, you're aiming for precision and efficiency. OK, writing four pages about a patient might feel like you're doing that patient a service, but you've got to think about the per person who's actually reading that. You might actually be doing the patient a disservice because the other doctor may be reading all this stuff and just be getting completely bored and might be, you know, missing the absolutely core points about that patient. So that's why precision and efficiency are so important when you're writing in the notes and clerking a patient. You need to be able to communicate what's going on with that patient efficiently and effectively. So just a few abbreviations. You're probably already aware of these. OK, so things like history is HX. On examination, when you write that, it's O slash E. When you're doing the OBS, OK, you're going to be doing this a lot. You're going to be trying to balance the notes in one hand while having the OBS chart in the other hand, you know, while trying to write what they are on the consultant ward round and that kind of stuff. You don't want to be writing out full hand temperature equals 37.5. Pulse equals 90. You know, use these common abbreviations, T, P, B, P, blood pressure, R, R, respiratory rate, GCS, um, or AVPU if that's what you're using. OK, so use common abbreviations. Timings. This is really, really useful, OK, to save yourself having to write one month history or, you know, four weeks history or three day history. Use these common abbreviations for timings. OK, so X over 12 is months, X over 52 weeks. X over seven days, X over 24 hours. OK, these are commonly used, commonly understood abbreviations that are used really commonly in hospitals. Um, and to be honest, if you're not using them, you're going to look like a rookie. So, you know, just use them all the time. Other stuff you're going to see, um, you may have already seen this in the notes, are things like ATSP. That stands for ask to see patient. This is a situation when you get bleeped by a nurse. Patient may be scoring two and you're asked to come and see them. So you'd write in your entry in the notes, you'd write ATSP, um, re high, you know, uh, scoring two, high temperature, et cetera, et cetera, or ask to see patient by nurses. OK, so that's a good way to start a good sort of uh, title for your entry. NAD, OK, nothing abnormal discovered. This is particularly useful for when you can't be bothered to do cranial nerves. Or you want to, and you want to say that you've done it anyway. You write cranial nerves NAD. You'll see that in the notes all the time. Basically, if you ever you see cranial nerves NAD in the notes, they didn't do the cranial nerves. Okay, stuff like N for normal. Okay, P for plan. Really useful. If you're on a ward round, a little mini ward round, perhaps midway through the day, um, or you're accompanying your registrar seeing an unwell patient. Okay, and you want to write a little entry there. You can do seen by. Okay, so seen by. Dr. Jones, 
gastro reg and then you can start your entry underneath that if you've written something in the notes and then you've called your SHO or your registrar make sure that you document that properly make sure you document what you um, what you've discussed and who that person is okay and one easy way to do that is uh, D slash W so that just stands for discussed with you know so patient you, you might you know discussed with uh, Dr. Hilton cardiology registrar re new onset AF advised etc etc will come and review the patient okay and then follow up another one commonly used so just make sure that you're familiar with these things look for them in the notes and start practicing actually using some of these abbreviations because they're really really useful okay so how do you write actually in the notes now the key thing is when you're writing in the notes is to have some sort of structure so just like we've spoken about structures in the past you know we've spoken about SBAR um, We've spoken about things like move for medical emergencies, A, B, C, D, E, that kind of stuff. You need a structure for writing in the notes. OK, so the way that you generally always do it is you start your entry with the reason you're seeing the patient. OK, so that might be ward round, surgical ward round, Mr. Smith, consultant. It might be seen by Dr. Hilton, gastro reg. OK, it might be seen by F1. Ed Wallet, okay, whoever you are. It might be ATSP, Ed Wallet by the nurses because they've got a high temperature, etc. So that's your sort of title and you underline it. The next thing you put down is absolutely vital, okay, and this is the problem list. This is a succinct, short summary of the background of that patient, okay. So this, we've seen this before yesterday when we spoke about your ward list, okay, it's pretty similar to what you have on your ward list. You've got a problem list there, okay? And that helps to focus you on the patient, what their reason they're in hospital, what their background information is. And it also helps um, your colleagues who come along to read your entry to just quickly get associated with what's going on with that particular patient, okay? And then what you do is you do a SOAP assessment, okay? So SOAP stands for Subjective Objective assessment and plan okay so subjective is how the patient feels all the stuff about the patient's history okay so might be you know patient feels well no further shortness of breath not feeling feverish say they've got a community acquired pneumonia the objective bit is you looking at them okay so it might be patient looks clinically improved no obvious signs of uh, respiratory distress. Okay, that's your objective bit. A is the assessment. Okay, so this would be your little drawing of the lungs with the crepitations or, you know, the arrow through saying that the lungs are clear. It might be where you put the observations if you're on your ward round or if you're seeing the patient. And then P is your plan. So that's an, a list, one, two, three, four, of what's next for that patient. Okay, so it might be one, organized repeat chest x ray to speak to um, microbiology registrar, re-change in antibiotics, that kind of thing, okay? So SOAP is a really, really useful acronym just to really structure the way that you write most entries uh, in the notes. And you can't really go wrong if you take that approach each time, okay? So practice using that. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about the problem list, okay? The thing that distinguishes, in my opinion, good F1s from bad F1s are the ones who are the ones who write the good problem lists. OK, a really good, concise bit of background about the patient and why they're in hospital and what led them to this point in their stay. OK, it doesn't have to be two pages long. It shouldn't be two pages long. It should be maybe one, two, three, four, just a couple of points. Um, you know, it might be number one admitted on. 2nd of July with community acquired pneumonia on antibiotics, CRP improving. Two, diabetes mellitus currently stable. Three, stage four renal dysfunction or something. Okay, that just gives an instant information rich, short, relevant overview of what's going on with that patient. Useful for you to get to know the patient and also useful for your colleagues when they come to read your entry. Okay. However, saying that, the problem list changes, okay, and it probably needs to be rewritten, okay, so you're not going to be just, don't just 
copy the problem list from the problem list that someone else wrote like two days ago. I've seen some people sort of flicking back through the notes to find the most recent problem list and then just copying it down. It needs to be up to date. It needs to be an up to date snapshot of what's going on with the patient. And if you're looking after patients on your list on a day to day basis, it's really useful. You can often just get the problem list from your patient list because you've got it right there sitting there. Another great thing in problem list, it helps to get you to learn about the patient and it helps you to present the patient to your seniors. So if you're writing this problem list over and over again and you're refining it and making it better during the course of a patient's stay, then it helps you to really, really get to know the patient. And also it helps you when you're in that stressful situation trying to get a CT abdomen for the patient down in radiology to actually describe to your colleagues what's going on with that patient. OK, so it's useful. So here's a nice example. I'm going to get, show, you, show you a little example now of a whole sort of entry. This might be for a ward round, for example. 89 year old female admitted on the 2nd of June. Current issues, community acquired pneumonia on day two of IV and MOX and erythro, clinical improvement. And then the notice here, we've got a bit of background. We also know she's had got hypertension and she's had a previous hip replacement in 2007. OK. Nice, concise, information rich and up to date. We're then going on to use SOAP, subjective, objective, assessment and plan. OK, so here's an example of an entry using SOAP. OK, so patient reports no shortness of breath or pain, feeling well. OK, that's your subjective bit when you've been asking the patient how they're doing. OK, your objective bit, what do they look like? How are they? They look well. There's no respiratory distress. I think they're getting better. Your assessment. OK, so the first bit of the assessment in most entries is going to be the OBS. OK, so you're going to have the OBS chart there. A really useful thing if you've got medical students with you on the um, ward round, get them. The beginning of the ward round, ask the medical student, you know, before I see every uh, patient and I'm writing in the notes, can you just grab the um, grab the uh, OBS chart from the end of the bed and just hold it for me so I can actually see it? and copy down the observations. That's quite useful if you've got med students around. Um, and then you're writing the most pertinent bits of information, chest clear, JVP normal or not elevated. And then finally, we've got the plan there. Arrange, repeat chest x-ray, repeat CRP, and then start discharge planning, start home planning. Okay, so hopefully with that example, um, your, you can see how we're using SOAP and how we can use it in nearly any situation for any type of entry to really structure what we're writing to be concise and clear. OK, so before you start, look for this pattern in the notes, perhaps have a practice after today, you know, actually just making up a few patients and writing like a quick problem list, making up a patient just like you had an EMQ in the exam, write a quick problem list and then write a, and, and practice a few entries so you're familiar doing it. I realize that some of you, um, different medical schools often get students to do this, um, but if you're not familiar with it, do have a practice doing that. Okay, now I want to move on to talk about how do you really clerk a patient? Okay, now the key thing here is there is a huge difference between a medical student clerking and a doctor clerking. OK, so when you're doing a clerking as a medical student, the purpose of doing that is for your education to make you better and to show to the person assessing you and who's trying to help to teach you that you know how to do a history examination and to write some sort of management plan. OK, however, when you're a doctor, things are slightly different. Your aim really is more patient focused. OK, you're trying to get the relevant information at the right time in that patient's journey to formulate a management plan and then present what you think to your seniors so that they can confirm what you think and then action it. OK, so it is quite different. And I want to just explain how you might want to change the way that you're currently or have currently or have previously done clerkings to adapt to being a doctor doing a clerking. OK, so at the moment, you're probably familiar with this sort of setup. You've got your presenting complaint, history presenting complaint, past medical history, drug history, allergies, social history. And then, of course, you've got your, you know, maybe you've got systems review and you've got your examination, et cetera, et cetera. And then your management plan. OK, 
in a doctor clerking, what's really, really important for your colleagues and also actually for you before you even go and start seeing the patient is getting an idea about the background of that patient. And we've already spoken about that when we spoke about the importance of putting the problem list in each note, uh, in each entry in the notes. So actually, when you do a doctor clerking, you should move up the past medical history to just below the presenting complaint. OK, and what I actually do is I relabel that as background. OK, so I might write in the notes, 78 year old lady presents with chest pain. And then under that have the background. And then I would list in a one, two, three, four, five, all the pertinent pieces of past medical history that were relevant to that presenting complaint um, in, in, in order of relevance. OK. And only after you've done that, do you then get to do your typical history of presenting complaint and then all your drug history, allergy, social history, et cetera, et cetera. OK, because when your consultant or when one of your colleagues comes to review your clerking, OK, before they want to hear anything about the chest pain and the Socrates and the sight onset character, all that kind of stuff, they actually want a sort of mental picture of that patient in their mind in order to make that history of the presenting complaint relevant. That's why it's useful to have that background at the top there. You're basically setting the scene for the rest of your clerking. So do think about doing that. In fact, what most doctors actually do is they write the background before they even go and see the patient. OK, and they use a process called data mining. And this is the reason often if you've ever worked on a medical assessment unit or something like that, you don't always see the docs talking to the patient. They're often in the office on the computers trying to get all the information about the past history of that patient. So they can write that background session before they even go that background section before they even go and actually see the patient. OK, and this process is called data mining. OK, now this process can be very, very tricky. One of the big problems we have in the UK at the moment is that we don't have very joined up healthcare records. OK, so if I go uh, and off to Edinburgh for the weekend and I get drunk and I fall over and I break my wrist, they're going to find it very difficult to find out any medical information about me because I live in London. OK, we don't have joined up communicating healthcare systems. So often First of all, you need to try and get as much information as you can. And you often you need to get that from multiple sources. OK, so, yes, you can get it from the patient, but you also want to try and retrieve the notes from that patient. Often looking at the old discharge summaries is a great way of finding out the background for the patient. OK, look at um, uh, uh, past A&E attendances. This is something that often people don't think about. But if you're really stuck and the patient doesn't have any notes and you know they've come through A&E, if you pop down to A&E, often there'll be cards down in A&E or records. Often A&E systems um, records are kept separately to the main hospital ones. So go down there, have a look at the cards that they use, and you might find a really good background problem list there that you can use to help you with the background section of your clerking. If the patient has some sort of chronic disease, perhaps they've got multiple sclerosis or they've got COPD and are known to the respiratory team, don't be afraid at this stage to pick up the phone and speak to the person who's looking after them. OK, because I guarantee you that the respiratory specialist nurse, if it's the COPD or the neurology registrar or something like that, will have a lot of information available about that patient. will probably be able to tell you all the pertinent background immediately. It might take you 15 or 20 minutes to actually find if you try to, you know, sieve through three whole stacks of notes for that patient. OK, so don't neglect this initial stage of the patient clerking where you're data mining, getting a really good background. OK, so this is the kind of thing you're aiming for. OK, we've got a 65 year old male who presents with chest pain. That's our presenting complaint. And then we have sat in the office for a while. We've looked through the notes. We've called up St. Thomas's. We've looked at the past discharge summaries and we figured out that this is a really good background, which is going to make our lives easier and give a really good impression for our colleagues when they come to review this patient. OK, because before they want to know about anything about the chest pain, they want to know, OK, this patient had a previous PCI in 2009. 
it was at St. Thomas's. Okay, that might be really important if you need to call up the cardiologist at St. Thomas's to find out about the patient. We know they're on hypertension. And notice here how I've actually incorporated the relevant drugs into the background. Okay, and you can do this and your colleagues will love you for this because suddenly they don't have to flip ahead to find the drug history section. They can just see, okay, the patient's on hypertension and this is the current treatment for that. The patient has got hypercholesterolemia and they're taking simvastatin. The patient, had, except you see what I mean. And what I often do in addition to this is down the right hand side of the page by the background, if I've got space, I will actually just list all the drugs down there as well. OK, because that's another piece of really useful background information. OK, so that's enough on background. Hopefully it's clear. Try and start practicing that when you start as an F1. OK, so next, let's talk about history of presenting complaint. OK, so this is important, obviously, that you're describing why the patient's come into hospital, what's been going on. Use some of the abbreviations we discussed, you know, one over, you know, three over seven history of shortness of breath, you know, two hour history, two over um, 24 history of chest pain, etc, etc. For red flags, okay, you can write them very quickly, okay, using this notation of the superscript zero, okay, so no next if this would be for meningitis, okay, if you wanted to, meningitis might be a red flag for the presenting complaint and you want to just show they don't have any, any symptoms of that. You do zero neck stiffness, zero photophobia, zero rash. Okay, and that can be a really quick way of expressing the fact that you have asked questions pertinent to that. Okay, rather than writing some really, really long prosaic entry that takes two sides. Okay, you will do that eventually if you are lucky enough to do psychiatry, but in medicine you want to try and be as precise as possible. Okay, next we come to drug history and allergies. As I said, I like to actually put the drug history down the right hand side of the continuation paper right next to the uh, background um, at the start of the clerking because I found that people want to know about that um, pretty early. And then the next thing, the social history is much, much more important as an F1 um, compared to when you're a medical student. OK, one of your crucial roles um, as an F1 um, particularly nowadays where we're dealing with a more and more frail and elderly population in hospital who have complex discharge planning issues, is you need to try and get a really good social history to create a window into that patient's life, to consider what their functional state is at home, where they live, who else is at home, okay? Because that patient is going to maybe going from the hospital to uh, a nursing home, maybe going to a care home, they may not be able to go home. And as soon as you can get a full picture of the social history, the sooner you can get the physiotherapists, the OTs, the social workers involved in planning the most appropriate discharge for the patient. OK, one of the things that actually kills patients most often is actually staying in hospital for too long um, because their discharge planning isn't organized properly. And then they end up getting urosepsis, they might end up having a fall and having sub subdural or something like that. So actually doing a good social history can make a significant effect on the patient's outcome following a um, admission into hospital, particularly an elderly patient. OK, now we come to on examination. OK, now the first thing is always the OBS. OK, so you want a fresh set of OBS. If there isn't a fresh set of OBS, ask the nurse for one. If the nurse is busy, just do the OBS yourself okay okay now is the bit where you get to be creative for the first time okay what you don't do is imagine that you're in oski mode and you start and you say to the patient oh hello there my name is uh, dr wallet uh, i'm an f1 doctor i'd like to examine your cardiovascular system would that be okay and then you wash your hands and then you start the hands and you feel the pulse look for any clubbing and start putting the fingers together looking for you know that sort of diamond shaped thing and then you work up the arm and then you finish that and then you step back and you go, oh, hello, my name is Dr. Wallet. I'm an F1. Um, would it be OK if I examined your respiratory system? OK, you need to develop rather than the segmented examinations that you get taught at medical school. You need to develop your own quick but effective top to toe examination that incorporates all the relevant systems of the patient. OK, so I'll tell you what I do. When I see a patient, obviously the introduction, all that kind of stuff. 
Um, I spend quite a lot of time standing actually just looking at the patient. Often the patient thinks I'm quite odd, uh, but I, I stand, I look at the patient because that's very, very useful just to get a complete view of what's going on. I then start at the hands, do all the things for all the systems in the hands while I'm doing that, feeling the pulse, moving up the arm, moving to the face, looking for all the different signs from all the different systems that might be relevant there, looking at the JVP, moving down to the chest, and I do then the heart sounds and the lung exam, one after another, then move down to the abdomen, do the palpation of the al uh, albumin, looking for any organomegaly. And then I might move on to do a quick neurological examination um, if that was particularly relevant. Okay, but this is a time, that's what I do, but this is a time when you need to develop your own quick top to toe examination that you can use for most patients and use effectively and over and over again. Okay, so start having a think before you start about what your personal examination is going to involve. Okay. So next we come to the plan. Okay, now this is the bit where actually, you know, as a medical student, you probably sort of would write one differential and then maybe a couple of bits in the plan. Um, but now, you know, if you're clerking in a patient, you need to actually do something. Okay, so you need to have a, a major primary diagnosis, maybe one or two other differential diagnoses, not the end of the world if you don't have them. But you do need to write a good management plan. Okay, because otherwise the nurse is going to be all over you. What, what do you want to do for this patient? What's going on? Where are we going with this patient? Now, you always get the first bit for free. You always get the first four points pretty much of any medical clerking for free. And that's the UBEX special. OK, you might if you're familiar with PodMedics, we talk about this quite a lot. OK, and this is basically a list of stuff that you pretty much do for any patient, medical or surgical, who's being acutely admitted into hospital. OK, U stands for urine. OK, and it also includes a pregnancy test if that's relevant. Don't forget that bit of U. B is for blood tests. OK, both uh, venous, usually just venous, but don't forget arterial if, if that's going to be um, relevant in, in, in your patient's case. E is for ECG. I don't care if they got chest pain, but most patients coming into hospital are going to end up having an ECG simply for baseline reasons. X is for x-ray. Okay. Once again, pneumonia or no pneumonia, COPD or no COPD, most patients coming in acutely into hospital will end up having some form of imaging chest x-ray uh, routinely, um, but this also helps to remind you if you're looking at a surgical patient that you probably need to be requesting an abdominal film or that kind of stuff. And then special, that basically, this is your moment to try and think of, you know, any other particular, you know, test that you think would be relevant. Okay, so maybe you've got a 35-year-old man um, who's come in with, you know, right uh, a loin to groin pain is in an awful amount of pain and you you think that this patient um, may require uh, CTKUB to look for a kidney stone and this would be the point where you think oh yeah that's my special test here that's my diagnostic test okay pretty much always in the management plan as an F1 you're going to write this term senior review okay but actually make sure that you do get the senior review okay once you've done your clerking you should be presenting it to a registrar usually um, who's going to confirm your management plan, perhaps make some additions, perhaps use your clerking as a teaching point. And then the last thing is treatment. OK, now when you first start, OK, your treatments are pretty much going to consider or most cases sort of fluids, antibiotics, oxygen, um, maybe start some TED stockings and heparin. But as you get further on through your F1, you're going to get more confident. You know, you're going to get more confident in the case of perhaps a patient you're clerking with atrial fibrillation of starting them on, uh, you know, high dose heparin, thinking about the warfarin, thinking about um, controlling their ventricular rate, perhaps prescribing them some bisoprolol or something like that. But these are things that you're going to gain in, in, in confidence. You're not expected to be able to completely manage complicated patients from day one, but you are expected to do the basic things in your management plan, like UBEC special, and escalating to senior review and doing basic treatments like fluid, pain, antibiotics, that kind of stuff. Okay, so that is all about clerking. Are there any questions on clerking before I move on to talk about the dreaded TTOs? 
Everyone loves clocking. Okay. Okay. Let's talk about TTOs. Okay. Now, TTOs can, if you do them the wrong way, turn into the most depressing thing ever. And they always happen at the same time. There's always like five of them to do at 4 p.m. on a Friday evening. Okay. Now, the mistake that most F1s make with TTOs is that they think a TTO is a court-like recording of every single event, every blood test, every x-ray, every single thing that happened to the patient while they were in hospital, okay? Now, that's not the case. If you do that, okay, then all that's going to happen is that the GP is going to look at your discharge summary and is just going to go, uh, what was the diagnosis? Do I need to do anything? And not read the rest of it. OK, and that actually could be disadvantageous to the patient. So if you're writing four sides of TTOs and feeling very proud of yourself, actually, you may not be doing the patient a great service because you're creating a great deal of noise around what the core information is about that patient. So actually, I'm going to switch now to my desktop here and show you an example of a crap TTO, which I wrote earlier. Uh, I don't want to open it. You, no, let's open it here. I'll make it nice and big. Oh, oh, we need to make it bigger. Zoom 200%. So hopefully you can see that. Okay, so this is the kind of thing that you don't write. Okay, so here we go. 78 year old lady admitted on the 16th of July with four day history of cough, productive of sputum and fever. She was confused. No signs of meningism, no cellulitis. You see how you're just reciting the clerking and writing it. Bowel open normally. And then you're writing lots of stuff about the examination. The GP really does not care that the temperature was 37.8 and the pulse was 92 on admission and the blood pressure was this. Okay, and that there was dullness on the right base. Okay, and all the blood test results. And then notice down here, we're doing another thing which is totally wrong. So we're providing this overly in-depth timeline. Day two, CRP was 20, urea was 10. Okay, day three, obviously this patient started to get a bit of a UTI, okay, and started on trimethoprim. Okay, so this is not the kind of thing you should be writing. That same patient could be written, if I can work my computer properly. Okay, let's get zoom in. Literally like this. This is the kind of thing the GP will read and love you for. 78 year old female, no past medical history. Admitted on the 16th of July with community acquired pneumonia. Responded well to empirical treatment. UTI diagnosed and treated during admission. Patient now fit for discharge. Please follow up with chest x-ray in six weeks time. Okay, that is a very good discharge summary. Okay, it describes what happens. It's concise and it asks the GP what they, it tells the GP what they need to do going forward. Now, the way that I advise you to write your TTOs, okay, is to write them from memory, okay? So basically, when you sit down to write your TTO, don't have the notes there, okay? You can refer to them if you need them a bit later, but if you've been looking after that patient, just try and write a summary from memory about what happened with that patient during their stay just like you were on the phone to the GP if you were doing a verbal handover, okay? If you do it that way, you're guaranteed to keep it relevant and concise, okay? So that's my general advice on discharge summaries, okay? Don't kill yourselves over them. Try and make them short and concise. Any questions about discharge summaries? Let me get back to the slides. Where are the slides? Here. Okay, and that's why we've got an elephant here, because elephants never forget. Okay, so in summary here, we've looked at problem lists, okay? Get really used to writing problem lists, both on your ward list and also in the notes for each entry. Use SOAP, subjective, objective, assessment, and plan, okay? Before you, if you're clerking a patient, before you go and see them, Write that background and that drug history at the top of the clerking, having done your data mining. Think about the social history and how that's going to actually affect the outcome of your patients if you get it right from the start and get social planning started from the beginning. Okay. 
don't be afraid to treat patients, to start basic treatments, fluids, pain relief, TED stockings, all that kind of stuff. And try and write your TTOs from memory um, if you can. Okay, so we've got a question coming through here. Uh, is it appropriate to ask GPs to sort out follow-up x-rays? Yes, absolutely. Uh, a TTO is a transfer of care back from secondary care to primary care. If your consultant has said that that patient needs an x-ray in six weeks, okay, and they're not being followed up by the consultant, then the GP needs to know about that and the GP needs to action that, okay? Obviously, you know, a GP is someone who has had more training than you, so you need to choose your words carefully, okay? But you absolutely, you know, should feel empowered to ask your colleagues to do things, even if they are more serious, even if they are more, uh, not serious, more senior. Um, just in the same way that you would ask uh, a colleague to come and see a uh, a sick patient. Another question. Uh, when do you do a problem list for a patient? Ward round, every new patient on the ward, clerking. Okay, so problem lists are mainly, I would use them every time I was writing, once the patient had been admitted, once I was writing in the notes. Okay, so if I had time um, during the consultant ward round, I'd squiggle a quick problem list. Uh, below the consultant ward run. Often you don't have time for that, but if you're seeing the patient yourself on the ward, then you should definitely write a problem list. If you're on call and you've been asked to see a, um, a patient, then you should write a problem list. If you've got a new patient, say that's been trans there's been a transfer of care from one team to another, perhaps the surgical team, orthopedic team did a hip replacement and they're happy that from that perspective, things are stable, but the patient requires discharge planning. So they've transferred the patient over to the medical team. Then it is worth you doing a really decent background problem list once that patient actually gets transferred over to the, the care of the medical team. OK, clerking is a little bit different. OK, I would say that the background technique that I taught you is a sort of elongated problem list. OK, um, it's a sort of extra problem list. Did someone ask that? Okay. Any other questions about writing in notes or clerking or anything like that? Oh, good. I'm glad. <laughs> so we have had one question, which Robert's made about it. What is the ideal uh, dress code for day-to-day -day ward stuff? Uh, okay. So this is going to vary according to where you work. A lot of hospitals now actually have a junior doctor uniform. Um, which is usually pretty disgusting, um, which you might be asked to wear. But generally, it's exactly the same as what you wore um, as a medical student. I think that would be fair to say. Um, don't dress too provocatively. Uh, don't overdo that kind of thing, um, because that can you can get a reputation pretty quickly through that. So dress relatively conservatively, not over the top. Um, obviously I'm sure you, I'm sure gents know, you know, you're not, shouldn't be wearing ties and that kind of thing. Watches. No, you shouldn't really be wearing a watch to be honest. Um, it's not very infection control. People will hunt you down if you're wearing a watch and slap your wrists, but you can get one of those sort of nurse type fob watches, which, which looks pretty horrible, but you know, if you've got to do it, you've got to do it. Any final questions? 